Mr. Chancellor, Vice Chancellor of KDU, Admirals, Generals, Heads of the various Armed Services, Armed Forces, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here and to give you this address this morning. I would like to begin by congratulating KDU on the exceedingly wide range of academic as well as professional disciplines that you have brought under the remit of a single defense university. One would normally expect a university bearing such a name to focus on perhaps military history, uh, strategy, military strategy, science of weaponry, and so on. But the concept of defense itself has a much wider range of interpretation. And it is, it is to these that you have turned to expand the remit of your university. The primary aim of a well-established state is to ensure the defense and security of its citizens against attack from other states. And in this regard, an army, a navy, air force, and so on have their due place. There is also need to defend law-abiding citizens from other citizens. And here, institutions like the police and the judiciary play a role. Finally, there must be a system of defense in place uh, for, uh, to protect citizens against the state itself. And here, of course, we require the judges and the judiciary to be independent of the state. Finally, we can even think of even broader applications of the concept of defense that are the responsibility of an enlightened and civilized society. Defense against ignorance, bigotry, superstition, which all come under the heading of education and science. Our ancestors in the dim distant past would have watched the pristine, unpolluted night skies of the desert such as this, and would surely have yearned to understand their connection with the heavens and the external universe. But they couldn't quite grasp it in those days. They would have asked the most fundamental of questions that we continue to ask even today. How did the universe begin? How did life begin? Where do we humans fit into this grand scheme of things? Answers to these questions have evolved over centuries and millennia of history, moving from superstition, speculation, ultimately to scientific fact. In the fourth century BC, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, who was a pupil of Plato and a tutor of Alexander the Great, made two assertions that were to change the course of history. The first, was that the Earth was the center of the universe. Stars, planets, and all heavenly bodies revolve around a central Earth. The second Aristotelian principle was that life of every form arose and continued to arise spontaneously from non-living, inorganic, inanimate matter on the Earth. Both these assertions turned out to be wrong. But Aristotle was a towering figure in Western philosophy. So his wrong views, his totally wrong views, held sway for centuries. The first Aristotelian principle of an Earth-centered universe, a geocentric universe, that was adamantly held and defect, defended, set back the progress of science for many centuries in the Western world. Only after the completion of the most traumatic of scientific revolutions, the Copernican Revolution in the 17th century, was the geocentric philosophy finally abandoned. The second Aristotelian principle is of life being centered on the Earth and arising spontaneously on this planet. And this has been even more difficult to overturn. It has dominated philosophy and science for over 2,000 years and in many ways still continues to do so. The most 
famous challenge of spontaneous generation came from the work of the French biologist Louis Pasteur in 1859. From his experiments on the fermentation of wine and the souring of milk, he demonstrated that life seems always to be produced from life that existed before, leading to the dictum omne vivo ex vivo, meaning all life comes from life. This did not, however, deter later scientists like Oparin, Haldane, and Stanley Miller in the 20th century from developing their theory of the so-called primordial soup or the primordial sludge, pushing back the elusive event of spontaneous generation of life to a remote, perhaps unknown, geological past. Despite the paucity of supportive facts and a growing body of contrary evidence, this theory stubbornly dominates science and cripples its progress even at the present time. Pasteur's life from life dictum manifestly continues through the entire geological history of the Earth, all the way back to the time before the Earth itself existed as a planetary body. There is now no doubt whatsoever that life did not and could not originate on the Earth. The oldest evidence of life on the Earth has very recently been discovered in a rock formation in, Af in Australia that formed 4.2 billion years ago. That's a very long time ago. And this was very shortly after the Earth itself had formed and when comet impacts were frequent and ferocious. So the evidence is growing that comets carry primitive life that can seed a planet or planets like the Earth at the very first moment that life-friendly conditions prevail. On this picture, every single life form on the Earth, from the humblest single-celled organisms to the most complex plants and animals, has an antiquity that stretches back as far in time as we can imagine. All our DNA essentially came from space, carried in cometary bodies in the shape of viruses, bacteria, and even simple single-celled organisms. They originated in ways that we still do not fully understand, but all this took place certainly not on the Earth, but in the widest possible cosmic context. The beginnings of the theory of cosmic life, of which I was associated, uh, dates back to the middle of the 1970s when as a young researcher in Cambridge, I was trying to understand and unravel the composition of cosmic dust, that huge cloud that you see on the left. My investigations soon led to the conclusion that this dust was composed mainly of complex organic matter that made up about 1% of the mass of the entire galaxy. In the mid-1980s, the late Sir Fred Hoyle and I argued that comets also carried vast quantities of organic molecules. And when this comet, Halley's Comet, reappeared in 1986, measurements from space actually show this to be true. We explained the presence of organic molecules in interstellar space and comets as being the byproduct of living processes, bacteria and viruses in various states of decay and degradation. More recent studies of comets in the space age including the recent Rosetta mission to a comet called uh, 67PCG, that's the name of the comet, confirmed this point of view. Complex organic material escapes in these jets from, such a, from this comet. And more recently, in a comet called Lovejoy, we find a profuse emission of a sugar and methyl alcohol, the kind of alcohol that you have in whiskey or in wine, at a rate equivalent to about 300 bottles of wine per second. Nobody has been able to explain this process except by invoking the process of fermentation. So ferment fermentation seems to be the only rational explanation for this uh, type of uh, result. So there's now no doubt whatsoever that comets brought the first life to Earth 4.2 billion years ago 
and further encounters with commerce continued to bring new bacteria and viruses that contribute to the evolution of life on the Earth. Geologists have known for a while that a great surge of complex multicelled life appeared suddenly on the Earth about 540 million years ago. This is the so-called Cambrian explosion of life. And it is to this event that all of us and all plants and animals can trace their origins. And crucially, this point in time also marks a period that we've recently discovered when the Earth and the solar system was actually plowing through a giant cloud of cosmic dust with very frequent impacts of comets. Recently, it's been also found that the DNA of all life forms, including ourselves, carry viral footprints that link us to developments at this time. So Darwinian evolution is then relegated to a fine-tuning process, selecting the set of offspring best suited to local niches. And this is a hard pill, of course, for conventional biologists to swallow, conventional biologists trained in the narrow Darwinian point of view. But these are the emerging facts, and the sooner we admit them, the better. Recent advances in microbiology, including the discovery that many types of microbes can withstand the harshest imaginable environments, all point to their space origin. Plant seeds and even small microscopic animals called tardigrades have been shown to survive space conditions on the International Space Station, which orbits at a height of 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. There is no Darwinian sense whatsoever by which these extreme survival properties could have arisen by evolutionary processes confined to the Earth. Only in the context of an open cosmic system with an imperative need for surviving space travel could all such properties be understood. One of the most exciting areas of modern astronomy is the search for planets that are similar to the Earth orbiting dis distant stars. Many s studies have recently shown that there are huge numbers of such planets. In this system shown here called TRAPPIST-1, a star that is 40 light years away, seven habitable planets have been disco discovered. The nearest planet outside our own solar system is around a star called Proxima Centauri, which is just four light years away, and four light years away is just almost in our backyard. The currently estimated tally of Earth-like planets in our Milky Way system runs into some hundred billion, almost one for every sun-like star. It follows, therefore, that life of all types and forms that are known on the Earth, ranging from bacteria to plants and animals and even intelligent life, must, to a high degree of probability, be all pervasive and connected, interconnected in this way from one planet to another. Here on the Earth, our ancestral line of descent that led through primates and anthropoids to Homo sapiens over 100 million years ago shows clearly the relics of repeated viral and retroviral attacks, presumably similar to AIDS. At each such viral attack, the evolving line was almost completely culled, leaving only a small surviving immune breeding group to carry through with a relic form of the virus that is tucked away in its genome. It is the expression of such viruses over time that mark the progression and the branching points from early primates to modern Homo sapiens. There is now little doubt that viral sequences thus added provide evolutionary potential that led to new genotypes, new species at one end of the scale, and to new traits and capacities to express our genes in novel ways at the other. It is becoming clear that our entire existence on this planet is contingent on the continuing entry of cosmic viruses, entities which we had hitherto thought were merely vehicles 
for disastrous pandemics of disease. The positive role of such incoming viruses to evolution is only just be beginning to be revealed. It also cannot be denied that bacteria and viruses coming to the Earth from space could sometimes pose serious threats of pandemic disease, not only to humans, but also to plants and animals. With all the data that is currently av available across a wide spectrum of disciplines, I believe there is now an urgent need for the possibility of bacterial and viral ingress from space to be taken seriously. I cannot illustrate this better than by quoting from an article by Louis Weinstein, Dr. Louis Weinstein, published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the 6th of May, 1976, in which he reviewed all the available data relating to the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 that caused some 30 million deaths worldwide. And this is what uh, Weinstein said. The influenza pandemic of 1918 occurred in three waves. The first appeared in the winter and spring of 1917-18. The lethal second wave, which started at Fort Devons in Iowa, Massachusetts on the 12th of September 1918, involved almost the entire world over a very short time. Its epidemiological behavior was almost most unusual. Although person-to-person -person spread occurred in local areas, the disease spread on the same day in widely separate parts of the world on the one hand, but on the other took days to weeks to spread relatively short distances and so on. Uh, and it goes, ends by saying it was present uh, for the first time at Joliet in the state of New York four weeks after it was detected in Chicago the distance between those areas being only 38 miles. The crucial statement here is that it was detected in Boston and Bombay on the same day. With no air travel possible in 1918, simultaneous first strikes in Boston and Bombay is very strong evidence of a component of the virus falling in from space. From an examination of other historical pandemics, it is clear that conditions permitting the entry of pathogens from space may have involved in, may been involved in many instances on record. During the past two decades, tantalizing evidence of microbes currently entering the Earth has accumulated, but has been largely ignored or is not being pursued. Such data, as is presently available, was acquired relatively inexpensively in projects that involved balloon flights to the stratosphere and the recovery of infalling cometary dust. The first in a series of such experiments that I was involved in in collaboration with the Indian Space Research Organization was carried out in 2001 and 2006 with staggering results indicating that the inflow of microorganisms to the earth may be at the rate of some one-tenth of a ton per year, a huge amount. Recently, a group of Russian uh, astronauts have reported microorganisms on the outside of the International Space Station, on the outside external windows of the International Space Station at a height of 400 kilometers, and there is now no argument whatsoever about any possibility of terrestrial contamination. This, if it is accepted and proved, will res result in direct and unequivocal evidence of microbes arriving at the Earth from space. Perhaps more expensive and sophisticated investigations need to be carried out urgently if you are to prove beyond doubt that these microbes are unequivocally alien. The sad truth is that funding for such vitally important experiments is well now impossible to, to secure. Compared with other space projects for solar system exploration, the budgets involved for a project like this are trivial, but scientific and societal payoff could be huge. From what I have presented in these few minutes, I maintain that I, we cannot afford to ignore such evidence. Measures must be put in place to monitor the stratosphere for incoming potential pathogens before they fall to the ground. In the event of a threat being discovered, preventative measures such as the production of appropriate vaccines could be put in place. 
In this way, it may be possible to avert the worst consequences of any future pandemic that could threaten us in the future. The reluctance of some scientists to endorse this, this, these discoveries lies not in the quality of the data involved, but in a desire to maintain a conservative position, conservative Aristotelian position in relation to life on the Earth. Although the Earth was demoted from its privileged physical position at the center of the universe over 500 years ago, and not without anguish, the trend to regard life as being centered on our home planet has persisted almost to the present day. But a paradigm shift with far-reaching consequences is unquestionably imminent. In this lecture, in this talk, I have only had time to deal with a very few of the strongest point pointers to our cosmic ancestry. Our ultimate goal must be to confirm that the evolution of life takes place not just within a closed biosphere on a minuscule planet, Earth, but extends over a vast and interconnected volume of the cosmos. If it can be firmly established that we are not alone in the universe and that we are, in fact, the product of an evolutionary process that is not confined to Earth but operates on a grand cosmic scale, the implications for humanity would be immense. It will herald a sociological transformation more profound than any that has happened so far in human history. The supporting facts are all in place, waiting to be correctly analyzed, correctly pieced together into the grandest panorama that we can imagine. Enticing new vistas are opening up for research before our eyes, which will, it will be the privilege for future generations to explore. I would like to end with a quotation from a sonnet by the American poet Edna St. Vincent Millay from her book on sonnets uh, entitled Huntsman, What Quarry? And this is the, uh, the poem, which is highly relevant to what I said. Upon this gifted age, in its dark hour, rains from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. Thank you very much.